thanks to Black Hat for having me here today. And thank you, everybody, for attending. So yeah, let's start. Uh, well, I'm Ruben Santa Marta. I work as a principal security consultant for iActive, uh, mainly on embedded, reverse engineering, hardware hacking, transportation security, uh, radio frequency. And the agenda we've got for today it's uh, basically it's an introduction. Um, I, I'm not going to explain a lot of things uh, related to nuclear engineering because uh, you can find those uh, those uh, things in the white paper. It, it, it's impossible to to, to have a, a talk uh, explaining all the, the the things. So you can uh, consult the white paper to uh, to get a comprehensive uh, introduction to that thing. Um, then we'll move to uh, to talk about uh, portal monitors uh, from Ludlum, and then uh, pedestrians, vehicles, uh, these kind of portal monitors, and then we'll move to radiation monitoring systems. Uh, this time for from Miriam. Uh, we'll talk about the WRM2 protocol, the affected products, um, methodology, and vulnerabilities. Uh, we'll elaborate some attack scenarios, and finally, we'll uh, have some words on the uh, always interesting responsible disclosure uh, topic. So just to put things in context, uh, I started this research because I uh, read some articles that were really interesting uh, from the security perspective. Probably most of you know about the Three Mile Island incident. It uh, is the most significant incident that happened, nuclear incident that happened in, um, in, in the US. And uh, that uh, what is interesting about this uh, incident is that uh, the nuclear operators were uh, taking decisions according to the uh, measurements uh, that we're receiving from, from the instruments. The problem is that uh, those instruments, or most of them, were uh, sending false information. So operators were uh, taking decisions based on false information. So from the security perspective, that was uh, very interesting. So I decided to take a look at the nuclear security and see if I could replicate some way uh, this, this scenario. Uh, there is another incident that is not, uh, it's, it's less uh, known, uh, but equally interesting. Uh, it happened in Spain, in a fuel factory. Uh, someone, someone stole uh, 70, uh, yeah, 70 uh, fuel pellets, uh, and Nobody knows what happened, what really happened. And until today, no one has been arrested. And uh, yeah, so basically the idea is to see if uh, that could happen today. Well, basically we are going to talk about um, devices that detect ionizing radiation, which is the radiation that is able to knock uh, electrons out of their orbit. Uh, there, are, there are different kind of um, ionizing the radiation. We have alpha, beta, gamma, which is the most dangerous one for the human being because it uh, can penetrate uh, human tissues and it uh, breaks uh, biological processes and it's uh, really dangerous. So let's go to uh, the vulnerabilities. Okay, so um, the first one is about Lovelum. It's a US company that um, provides uh, port radiation portal monitors and other uh, instruments for a large number of facilities. Uh, you can see they, they, these devices are deployed in nuclear power plants, in uh, seaports uh, or dry ports, uh, border crossings, um, different, and also in different countries, including uh, US or China. So maybe you. Um, you have gone through one of these before. Uh, this is a portal monitor for vehicles. But uh, well, we find these kind of devices in uh, airports, uh, nuclear power plants. Basically, they try to detect the, any uh, radioactive uh, material that maybe is, uh, is, uh, can be, uh, or someone is trying to smuggle uh, from, from a nuclear facility or, or uh, also, they, they can prevent some radiological situations. 
So the first thing, uh, which is, as usual, it's very common. Uh, this is a pedestrian uh, portal monitor, which, is, uh, which are used in, in, um, in nuclear facilities, for example, and uh, at checkpoints. So I will see later uh, why this, this is happening. But in this case, this, uh, this uh, radiation portal monitor I don't have the phys physical access to this device, but uh, I downloaded the firmware and basically by reverse engineering the, the main application, which uh, is uh, .NET, uh, you can find that they have a password. It's uh, easy, it's nothing really exciting, but the problem is that uh, with that backdoor password and the variable is backdoor, I didn't uh, make up the name because it's .NET, so that's it. Uh, um, you can disable the, this radiation portal monitor, and you can basically get out with anything you want, like, a, like in the incident that happened in, in Spain. And uh, they also have some uh, radiation portal monitors for vehicles. Uh, in this case, it happened the same. Um, I didn't have access to the physical device, but I downloaded the firmware, and basically they have two protocols. One, which is the NetBurner uh, discovery protocol. You can use that to modify the network settings of the network interfaces. You can change the gateway, um, the, the IP. Uh, so basically, this opens the door to uh, man-in-the-middle attacks or any kind of uh, network attack. Mm -hmm. And then the, the protocol that they are, they are using to send uh, reading, readings to a central server, uh, it's clear text. So, I mean, it's, uh, there is nothing to do. Uh, it, it took like uh, less, than, uh, less than three days. So I stopped uh, looking at these uh, devices because, well, basically the security was, uh, or the lack of, of security. Well, it's, uh, was outstanding. Uh, so what, what kind of attack scenarios we have with these devices? Okay, so uh, one of the most interesting ones, I think, is that if someone wants to uh, smuggle um, some uh, radioactive material uh, from uh, at a border or in a port, uh, okay, so they basically uh, want to, um, to uh, to perform a man-in-the-middle attack where the, uh, the measurements for the radioactive material, the radioactive material they want to smuggle, uh, will, be, um, will be modified by some, by some valid readings, but other, uh, other radioactive materials will be, uh, will be detected. So they basically use um, a specific uh, material, which is the uh, scintillator, and in this case, this plastic uh, AGA uh, 200 scintillator. So if you have the physical device, you can take the measurements, you can simulate uh, what, what are the, the measurements this, uh, this radiation portal monitor um, takes, but I don't have the physical device. But I used uh, software for, from CERN, which is to um, simulate the um, the interaction of particles with matter, which is very nice and very powerful. So I just basically created uh, a, an initial simulation of this radiation portal monitor. You can see the, the video in, this, uh, in our <coughs> YouTube channel. Okay, so let's move to the radiation monitoring systems. In uh, nuclear design, we have um, or oh, they have actually a design principle uh, or a principle um, a principle uh, uh, the, that it's called the ALARA, which is uh, basically uh, we know that uh, radiation can be detected. We know that uh, radiation or we are exposed to radiation, but we have to prevent or we have to to uh, achieve the 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 lowest um, exposure to this uh, threat. So that's why uh, we have radiation monitoring devices to detect, to control, and to take measurements from, from to, in order to, to detect whether there is radiation and this is a potential threat or it's okay. So 
that's the, the purpose of these devices. Uh, there are different types of uh, radiation monitoring devices. You'll see that in the white paper. Uh, but basically, um, we have uh, some radiation monitoring devices that are used as an input for safety systems in nuclear power plants. Basically, uh, these um, radiation monitoring sy systems are able to uh, trigger automatic actions. So, for example, um, if uh, there is a radiation leak in, within the reactor building, uh, a radiation monitoring device uh, that is located there can trigger, for example, a shutdown, a, a, a shutdown of the reactor. But as far as I know, any of the products that are in the scope of my research are capable of doing that, unless there is some design uh, uh, choice that I missed. But I want to, to be crystal clear uh, on that. And, but all of them produce data that is consumed by operators, which is interesting. So, uh, well, we have uh, some uh, devices that are used basically uh, for teledosimetry, remote operation, health physics, and emergency response teams in case an, is of an accident, and to detect alpha, beta, gamma, and neutron, like uh, we explained before. Uh, according to the, to the standards in, in the nuclear industry, uh, there are two ways of, uh, there are two groups uh, related to the safety of the instrument and control, instrumentation and control devices. We have the not important to safety, uh, which we are not interested in that, and we have the important to safety. And within this uh, category, we have the safety systems, and uh, we have the safety-related system where the radiation monitoring devices uh, lie. But uh, if a radiation monitoring device is providing input to a safety system, it should be uh, rated as a safety system. That's important to, to know. Well, we have also some uh, other uh, concepts for uh, nuclear design, the area segregation. Uh, in a nuclear power plant, you have different areas that are um, uh, that, that have different criticality. We have the controlled area where it's the most uh, critical area. Uh, you have, you have um, checkpoints in order to enter into this area. Uh, it has to be physically, uh, even physically uh, segregated or at least uh, separated from other areas. And if you want to, to move from a supervised uh, area to a controlled area, you have to um, pass through a checkpoint that uh, maybe is using some of the radiation portal monitors we see uh, just few, we saw just a few minutes ago. And in the picture, you can see uh, a map from a uh, U.S. Uh, nuclear power plant, which uh, contains some of these areas. And we also have different zones that cover uh, different perimeters uh, around the, the nuclear power plant. Uh, so that's important also for, for uh, to know where uh, the area monitors should uh, be uh, deployed. Okay, so these are the these are um, the area monitors or the radiation monitoring devices that are affected uh, by this uh, research or these uh, vulnerabilities. So basically, Mirion is a company, a US company that uh, develops this um, this kind of uh, of um, of devices and. The protocol they use, the WRM2, is mostly a standard within the nuclear power plants to, for uh, teledosimetry and uh, remote operation. So um, you can see here different devices. Uh, in this case, you can you can imagine that this is the the, the server, the base transceiver, and all of them are the clients. So basically, all of them speak uh, the, this protocol and send the, the measurements, the readings, to the base transceiver that collects 
the, these uh, measurements and transmit those uh, that data to the uh, to a server to a software that uh, then processes this data and provide the the input for the operators. Then let's do the, let's do this. I'm going to show you um, three pictures of some of these devices, and if someone notice something interesting, please let me know. This is the first one. It's an area monitor from Ludlum. And this is the base transceiver. And we have finally an IPAM TX, which is um, used as a tele telemetry uh, module. Basically, it's, uh, it's uh, well, we have that one here, uh, a nuclear worker put the dosimeter here, and it's able to send uh, the, re the readings uh, via radio. So someone noticed something? X XB, yeah, XB. Yeah, so basically they, they, they all are using the same radio module, which is interesting. So what happens here, basically, uh, Mirion is, or Mirion has developed uh, its uh, WRM2 protocol on top of DG modules, which are commercially available. But uh, there is a specific uh, feature that it's um, it's a uh, it's a challenge for for the security from the security perspective. So if you can create a network using these modules, but there is. Um, there is a network ID that if you want to join a network or send packets to a network, to that network, you have to, uh, to, ha you have to, uh, to configure your module with that network ID. But there is a range which is reserved for the OEM range, um, which is uh, it's, uh, limited. You can't configure uh, a radio module with, uh, within a range that is reserved. So um, that's the way they thought they were protecting, protecting the, their network. If we uh, look at the implementation or the documentation, uh, we see that there are mainly three parameters that are used to, uh, to, to, uh, to know whether a packet uh, should be accepted by the receiver or not. And, uh, but yes, one of them is the is the the one that has a feature that prevents someone to to configure that one. If you can see, this is the the red only range uh, reserved for o OEM. So our goals are basically we need to access to uh, arbitrary DG uh, XSC networks. And uh, we also we are going to to perform an analysis of the XS, X, uh, SC uh, WRM2 protocol uh, using different approaches. The first one uh, is going to be the firmware, second radio, second hardware, and the third one radio. So firmware was uh, easy. Um, basically. Um, uh, DG provides uh, uh, software which is called XCTU, uh, so you can configure your modules, uh, you can create, uh, you can update a firmware, you can test uh, your networks. So um, I tried to to find the firmware, and it happened that uh, uh, for certain modules and certain versions, uh, the firmware is encrypted. So. Basically, I performed, uh, I reverse engineered the, the software to see what was going on. And I found the key, so that allowed me to um, decrypt the firmware and analyze the, it. So, how to unlock the OEM uh, range? Basically, um, this, is, uh, this uh, network ID is configured through uh, an AT command. So I discovered the AT command uh, handlers, and I, I, mm, I discovered also the AT ID command that uh, handles this, uh, this configuration feature. Um, as you can see, uh, there is a comparison to, uh, to see whether it is possible or not 
according to the range. So basically, we just need to patch that com that uh, uh, basic block, and uh, also we need to um, to uh, fix uh, a one byte checksum, which is at the end of the firmware. Then we should encrypt the uh, the firmware and reflash, and that's it. We can uh, we can uh, access any o OEM network uh, that uh, that is supported by this protocol from from DG. Um, there are other um, other uh, other interesting pieces of information you can extract from the firmware. Uh, this uh, this protocol from DG uses a frequency hopping, and we can see the the hopping patterns. Uh, for the different uh, for the seven hop sequences they they support they use uh, 25 different frequencies and seven hop sequences and in the framework you can you can find the the patterns which uh, we'll see uh, later later on that it's uh, useful uh, Miriam only uses the the first hopping pattern so that's also probably it's it's not the, the best way to do so, um, so one of the goals has been achieved. We can access the uh, the arbitrary arbitrary DG networks, but let's move to to the hardware part. So, basically, the DG module is a front end module, which is comprised of a of a MCU from uh, Silicon Labs, the EF32, and then a transceiver, the ADF7023. Uh, uh, so uh, they communicate through SPI, and you can see how we can <coughs> remove the metallic cover and um, solder the the wires in the specific places that we need to to tap into the SPI to see what's uh, what's going on. Um, I've got the, the sessions uh, recorded, and uh, you you can access access this uh, this data in the materials of the. Of the presentation that will be uh, released uh, short, shortly after after this talk, so you can play with it. Uh, in this um, case, after a reset, we see that the the MCU is um, loading a new firmware into the transceiver, which has a communication uh, processor. It's a eight bit uh, RISC processor. So basically, uh, we can dump the firmware, and in order to uh, clone that specific uh, behavior at that specific transceiver, because um, this is very useful for um, for attacking radio devices. When you are researching into a radio device from from a black box per perspective, um, usually it's uh, interesting to see how uh, the transceiver is configured, how what are the frequencies they are using, what are the modulation they are using, because in that way you can build your own transceiver, but Bypassing or uh, or improving the, the the mechanism they may have uh, uh, in the commercial version. So that's that's something we uh, we use a lot in iActive. So that's uh, interesting as well. Uh, in this case, uh, in this part, we can see also how they are configuring the frequencies the, they will use for uh, frequency hopping, and these are the. 25 frequencies, the the DEXC protocol uh, uses, and uh, you can see also the pattern number zero, the frequency hopping. Uh, it's imp where where it's implemented. Uh, so basically, uh, Mirion uses this uh, this uh, this pattern. So basically, this. Um, uh, if you we, if you look at the at the pattern, for example the number seven, you know that the the new the new one will be e, and the new one will be eight. That's the the way it works. Uh, so basically we can potentially uh, well actually we can build our own transceiver, um, but. It's um, it's interesting because um, this uh, radio module from from DG uh, uses a UART interface to go, to communicate with uh, with the 
with the MCU. So basically, if uh, some company wants to uh, send or receive data through one of these modules, they can basically uh, adapt their design to send and receive data through the UART interface in this module. So what does it mean? Well, if we buy a module that has already loaded the network ID from our target ne network, for example, the Mirion network, that's it. We can <laughs> just uh, use the UART to send and receive arbitrary data. And uh, it happens that this uh, device, this small device, it's uh, available on eBay for less than $200. Uh, $200, so that's basically what you, what you need to perform an attack against, um, against uh, the base transceiver and against the entire uh, architecture of the WRM2 protocol. So um, the application layer, which is basically the only part that is, uh, uh, that is um, uh, proprietary of, uh, of Million, uh, it's something like that. You have the ID, which is the, 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 the device ID, and then you have the payload, uh, which includes the readings, and then you have a checksum. So let's, um, let's uh, try a demo. <clears throat> so here we have the base transceiver, which is, as we have seen, the, the, the device that collects everything. So. Here we have this device that has already, has already uh, loaded the, the network ID from Mirion. So let's see if uh, uh, it works, and we can see how we can send arbitrary data to, to the base transceiver. Okay, seriously, uh, I don't know if, um, there is power in this uh, power strip, it's enabled, because it, it, it was working. Okay, now, okay, perfect. Okay. We connect, basically, the, the dosimeter, it makes an annoying Beep. So we have connected uh, the serial port of the base transceiver, uh, and um, we'll uh, we'll see uh, the, the data that it, that is coming. Okay, and uh, in the POC we have created, we are basically uh, sending through the other serial interface um, the data we want to, to send to the base transceiver. This is the IPAM USB. This is for COM10. Com Uh, 
let's see. It's, Well, you know, as usual, Last try. Okay, yeah, well, it works. Okay, so let's move to the radio uh, approach. Uh, Basically, we, we performed a reverse engineering of the radio protocol. And when you uh, analyze a radio protocol, you have to, uh, to collect enough information to at least cover um, some of these, um, of these uh, uh, aspects. Uh, we, we need to know the modulation, which in this, uh, in this case, it was uh, 2GFSK and the encoding scheme, uh, in this case, uh, biphase space. Uh, they were using uh, frequency hopping. And uh, we'll see how uh, we detect the, the channels and the center frequency, which, by the way, we, we found the center frequencies uh, during the, the hardware approach uh, by tapping into the SPI. And, uh, Basically, the, according to the documentation, the the, the RF <coughs> the RF packet uh, it's comprised of a, an initializer and then the data. Uh, from the data and the header, uh, we have the AT ID, which is the network ID. Um, that is the only parameter you can completely control when configuring <coughs> the radio module. Uh, so how the data is encoded in this protocol. Uh, they are using uh, biphase space, and we can see the, in this uh, picture uh, um, a capture of, the, of a transmission. Uh, and basically, this is FSK. And you can see how um, we have the two different frequencies that they are using. So a symbol is comprised of um, the one, uh, one <coughs> the two frequency, frequencies. Uh, so according to the documentation uh, of biphase space, uh, when the the when the the, the bit that is uh, uh, sent is zero, there is a change into the signal at, uh, in the middle of, of the bit time. You can see that uh, as a clock. So. Basically, it's a matter of, uh, of um, trying the different uh, encoding uh, schemes okay, in that uh, exist, uh, and that's it. Uh, the channels, uh, there are, uh, there are uh, 25 different channels, um, and, uh, and uh, every, channel, every channel has the same preamble, but then, every channel uh, has a different uh, synchronization word. That's important to, to perform another kind of attack we'll see later. Uh, I, I've created um, a tool to detect uh, the, the channels automatically because sometimes it's a little bit tedious. So um, basically it's, uh, it's uh, 
the, the idea behind this tool is just uh, it operates on raw IQ data, so it detects the signal and the noise uh, amplitude to uh, detect where there is uh, mm, there is a burst, and then we we calculate in that part we calculate the power spectrum density, and then according to the bins where the highest PSD uh, is present. <clears throat> we uh, we look for uh, the the frequency deviation, uh, and then we can calculate the the center frequency. Uh, the the source code is going to be uh, published in the talk material, so you can read it if you are interested. This is the output of of the tool, so yeah, you can save time to to collect uh, the channel uh, automatically. Okay, so basically we we uh, we, uh, we 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 were able to access the arbitrary DG uh, networks. We were uh, able to to know the the, the different um, parameters that uh, that can be used to replicate the 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 XSC uh, protocol and the WRM2 protocol. So that's uh, that's uh, enough. Uh, so some attack scenarios. Uh, there is uh, uh, an attack scenario that probably is the most obvious one. If you can falsi falsify um, radiation uh, levels, you can send data in order to simulate a radiation leak that is not happening. So. Um, as I mentioned before, any of the devices that are uh, covered by these research um, uh, triggers uh, automatic action. So it has to be, uh, this, that action has to be uh, triggered by a nuclear operator. So um, in the US, um, all the nuclear power, power plants uh, need uh, to, um, to, uh, to, to have uh, an emergency response plan, and uh, in in this emergency response plan, there are some parts that are called the emergency action levels. So, as you can see, um, according to an action, according to an, a scenario that may happen, this that scenario should trigger a specific uh, emergency or just a, an unusual event. So. Um, Taking into account that the attackers can uh, obtain these uh, documents, and also you can collect information from the internet on the nuclear power plants that are using these uh, these devices, you can perform uh, this kind of attack. You can see this picture uh, of a, a, a radiation monitoring device from. Million, similar to what uh, we have seen, and in a, an auxiliary uh, building roof, which is usually it's uh, very close to the reactor building. Uh, but we also have other kind of um, of, uh, of attack scenarios. For example, um, these uh, radiation um, monitoring devices are used in case of an accident, and. Um, if you can uh, fal falsify data, if you can send false readings uh, when a, an actual accident has happened, you can trigger uh, a, a, a failed evacuation because uh, the emergency response teams uh, uses the, 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 the radiation levels taken with these uh, devices to see the, the, the direction they should send uh, the people to. But if, you, if the radiation plume is going to the north, for example, and you are sending that going to the north is okay, uh, the evacuation would be uh, directed to the re directly to the radiation plume, which is bad. So let's move to the responsible disclosure. Uh, basically, uh, the first uh, uh, vulnerability was uh, reported to Ludlum uh, three years ago, and uh, well, they decided that because uh, these devices are located in secure facilities, 
it's okay. It's, they don't need to fix it. Uh, well, I don't know if uh, they changed their mind, but apparently not. Uh, we reported um, to DG a million. Um, DG um, don't, doesn't see uh, this as a problem for them because they actually they are not uh, selling secure modules. They tried to um, to secure the the firmware update. Uh, they failed, but this may or not or this may be a vulnerability or not, depending on the perspective. Uh, but well, according to uh, to them, they are not going to fix that uh, that part. And finally, million. <clears throat> Uh, basically, they, they told us that uh, they are not going to fix anything because it breaks uh, the compatibility, the backwards compatibility. Uh, so they can't remove, uh, uh, they can't add an encryption layer because uh, the WRN2 uh, application layer is not encrypted. So basically, <laughs> there is no way to, to fix this. But apparently, um, I don't know because I don't have the details, but they are trying to, to find some kind of uh, of a workaround or fix. Let's see in the in the near future what happens. So uh, that's all. Thank you for attending, and if you have any question. I wanted to ask you, um, it seems to me that based on this packet payload, uh, this is susceptible to replay attacks. Have you attempted yeah. that? So basically what, what is the point of? Well, uh, th there, is a, there is a packet ID. Oh. Apparently. Uh, but, well, mm, it, it doesn't change much the, the, the scenario. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, you basically you mean that if you collect enough uh, readings, you just need to transmit again yeah, yeah. the readings. Yeah. So what, what, what I, was, uh, I was a little late, but what's your motivation? Why did you go through all this research if it, it was simpler? Uh, because uh, in IOactive, we, um, we always uh, research into uh, topics that are important, that are uh, crucial for security of, of, and for safety. Oh. Um, basically, um, it's an interesting area. Uh, cool. Another question. So you said the firmware was encrypted. Um, how did you obtain the key if it was encrypted? Did you read the processor itself or no, the decryption key? The decryption, the decryption key is embedded in the software uh, DG provides. It's, uh, oh, they, they have an application. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, All yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. It's, uh, it's already encrypted. In, it's already embedded in the in the software. And one more question. Um, is it possible, th th does the transmitter have any telemetry? Is it possible to locate where exactly it is in relation to the nuclear plant? Uh, well, yeah, the, the range of these, um, of these uh, devices are up to uh, 45 kilometers or 20, 28 wow. miles <laughs> or something like that. So I don't know. The, the problem with this is that, well, obviously it depends on the gain of the antenna and other factors. but it's a significant distance, so you can perform, you can potentially perform an attack from 28 miles away or 45 kilometers in line of sight. Well, I want to say thank you for, it was very interesting to me. Okay, thank you. Hi. Uh, Hi. <laughs> did you try working with US CERT or any other organizations or did you just go through IO Active? How did you approach the disclosure and remediation yeah. we, we We always try to, uh, to contact the vendor, but in some cases it's not possible to, uh, so we, uh, we asked uh, for help uh, and we asked for coordination with uh, different CERTs in the US, the ICS CERT, and in Spain uh, we use uh, a national cert which uh, which handles the critical infrastructure in, in Spain. So yeah, we we always try to to contact the vendor, but but if if it's not possible, we we will try to 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 coordinate with uh, third third party agencies or or uh, institutions. Ah, well, uh, the response from vendors. W Ah, from the uh, uh, search? Yeah, they basically uh, tried uh, to contact the vendor and that's it. It's, uh, I mean, they are not, um, 
they are not uh, taking an active part. They are basically transmitting what, uh, uh, what you say. You, you send the information and they send this information to the vendor and they use the, their contacts to try to, <clears throat> to contact the, the vendors. Hey, hey Ruben, yep. I, got, I got a question. So uh, I'm Don, I'm actually from Digi International. Mm. I'm the CISO. So um, we've actually worked on this, so I want to let you know that he did a great job doing responsible disclosure. So I'm very happy as a CISO for that. I, I, trust me, that's great. Um, question I had for you, though, is um, I've been working on Miriam, and the case is with. Uh, uh, um, is, is open still and they're trying to figure out a solution to this. But this happens a lot. Um, we, we look at uh, security and particularly sensors and things out there that it really is to the end application designer to kind of do that risk assessment mm -hmm. for security to either put in encryption or authentication. In this case, um, I, I don't think necessarily encryption is the right answer. Um, but authentication is. And this is a major problem for IoT. Um, how do you authenticate data that is being done from remote sensors? And I think that's really my question. What would you permit? And the, the part that I would add that really becomes difficult is these devices, as you saw, are very, very small processors. So, you know, and loading something like OpenSSL and doing things, not possible. Um, mm -hmm. So what's your suggestion to try to have as a solution to something like this on well, sensors? There, there, I think uh, there is no uh, single solution because <laughs> As part of uh, as our daily job, we look at the uh, different uh, encryption authentication schemes to um, to see if they are secure or not. Uh, I think with the current uh, MCUs, it is possible to uh, to perform most of the of the um, operations that are needed to create a, a secure implementation, a secure authentication and encryption. But it's interesting because. Uh, when, when I talked to Miriam, they, um, they, they had in, in mind that uh, the, this network ID uh, feature you have in your modules was the way to protect their, their assets. And it's, uh, it's, uh, they, I think that's the interesting thing for me in this case because they were thinking that, okay, we have these radio modules and we don't need anything. But on the other hand, uh, you are not uh, selling a secure module uh, by itself. So, uh, the, it, Yeah, that was my impression when I did talk to them too is that they thought that, um, although it really is really more of an anti-competitive process mm -hmm. for that so that other people can't make modules that's on their network. Um, the one thing I will say though is there are actually XBs that do AES encryption um, and there are firmware loads that actually would work on that but they were not chosen at design time nor were they installed. So there is encryption capabilities there um, but we would always suggest it's done in the application anyhow um, at some level. But this is a very common three and I, and I find that many customers uh, have a very difficult time uh, consuming, you know, encryption, authentication, and these concepts in their design or their products, and they're just not alone. And I think it's the one thing I would challenge from the keynote this morning. I would also say that, you know, I think as a community we need to do better, and that's what Digi's trying to do is try to educate customers better to make this consumable in their products. So. You know, that's kind of what we're looking at. We actually do have, by the way, just to let you know, we actually have our, all of our new XBs going forward actually have a security chip. We're wow. using the AT, uh, AT, uh, ECC 508A from Atmel mm -hmm. that's actually going to be doing some secure firm, firmware boot things. Now, physical attacks will still be possible, but you would not be able to remotely load firmware. So that's one of the things that we've been working on, um, but which I think this research proves that it's something that we definitely need to do as well. Okay. So that's one piece. That's cool. I mean, it's uh, interesting your your uh, input because I mean you are from Digi, so that's good. Thank you very much. Thank, thank Ruben. We'll take any additional questions down in South Seas H, so that we can clear the room for the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you.